guard the good deposit entrusted to you by the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Guarding the deposit of faith is the mission which the Lord has entrusted to his church and which she fulfills in every age. This treasure, received from the apostles, has been faithfully guarded by their successors. All Christ faithful are called to hand it on from generation to generation by professing the faith, by living it in fraternal sharing, and by celebrating it in liturgy and prayer. The Paschal Mystery of Christ's Cross and Resurrection stands at the center of the Church's mission and teaching. It is the center of the gospel to be preached to all the world. In fact, God's saving plan was accomplished once and for all through Christ's redemptive suffering and death. The Church, of course, remains faithful to the interpretation that all of sacred scripture points to this pivotal event in our salvation history. The Lord himself spoke of this when he was speaking to those two disciples on the road to Emmaus. The Lord said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Think of some of the Old Testament moments that we recall that point to this event. We think of the priest king of Salem, Melchizedek, who was the first person recorded in scripture to offer a bread and wine sacrifice in thanksgiving to God. We think of the Passover, of course, the Israelites before they left Egypt to go travel to the promised land offered an unblemished male lamb whose roasted flesh they ate and whose blood they put on the doorposts and lentils of their homes, just as we consume the flesh of Christ and the blood of Christ darkens the doorposts of our souls, our lips. We think of the man in the desert when the Lord God fed the Israelites that bread from heaven. The Lord, of course, later would say that he is the true bread come down from heaven for the salvation of the world, for the nourishment of his people. Or the show bread that was established to always be in the presence of God, whether before the ark of God or in the temple. All of these Old Testament events that point to this beautiful sacrificial offering, the passion of our Lord, as well as to his resurrection from the dead. It's why even now, every single Sunday is a commemoration of the resurrection of Christ from the dead. It is the highest of our teachings, the highest teaching of the gospel. It's also why every Friday is the day that we commemorate the Lord's Passion by offering some sacrifice or penance, whether by abstaining from meat or doing some act of charity or doing some other work of penance. Fridays and Sundays now every week are our commemoration of the Lord's saving death and his resurrection from the dead to remind us of the centrality of this teaching of the gospel. Of course, in Scripture, we see Jesus as a faithful follower of the law, along with the Holy Family. But of course, many of Jesus' teachings and words and deeds ended up being signs of contradiction to the world, as the prophet Simeon had prophesied when the child Jesus was brought to the temple by Mary and Joseph. Because the Lord cast out demons, he was accused of being in league with the devil. Because he forgave sins, he was accused of being a blasphemer. 
Because he healed illnesses on the Sabbath, he was accused of violating the Sabbath law. Because he ate with tax collectors and sinners, he was chastised by many people. Because of some of these actions, certain Jewish leaders and certain civil leaders sought for a way to put him to death, basically to destroy him. Again, Simeon preached that this would take place. He prophesied that this would take place when Mary and Joseph brought the baby Jesus to the temple. And we see that being fulfilled throughout the Lord's life. But the Lord, of course, takes the law and raises it to a higher level. In fact, he takes the law of the Old Testament and translates it through divine eyes. The Lord himself in the Sermon on the Mount said this, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. From that point, we see the Lord himself continuing the Sermon on the Mount, the Mount of Beatitudes, doing his work of fulfilling the Old Testament law, by giving it to the people in a new way of thinking. The Lord has a series of statements where he says, You have heard that it was said, but I say to you. In this we see the Lord taking on the role of Moses of old. As Moses was given the law on Mount Sinai, now the new lawgiver is taking the Old Testament law and bringing it to its completion, to its fulfillment, once again, through the divine eyes. He did not abolish the law, but he fulfilled it and brought it to a perfect understanding for his followers. Jesus, Israel's Messiah, was to fulfill the law in his all-embracing detail. He is the only one who could keep the law perfectly because he is the divine legislator born subject to the law in the person of the Son. But Jesus fulfills the law to the point of taking the law upon himself, taking upon himself the curse of the law, as you read in the book of Deuteronomy. For his death took place to redeem them from the transgressions under the first covenant. And so the Lord not only brings the law to a new level of fulfillment and completion, He completes the entire law in himself through his saving sacrifice. Like the prophets before him, Jesus Christ showed the ultimate respect to the temple in Jerusalem. He, being God, of course understood the temple to be the place of God's dwelling. He was presented there, of course, 40 days after his birth, We read in sacred scripture that the Holy Family traveled to the temple every year for Passover. There was a time, of course, when the Holy Family went when the Lord was 12, and he was behind speaking with the Pharisees and the scribes. When the Holy Family found him, he told them, Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? He knew where his father's business was taking place because he knew that the temple was a special dwelling of the Lord. For the Lord, of course, this was a privileged place of encounter, which he knew very well. However, the Lord also foretold the destruction of the temple in connection with his own death. We see in this moment the Lord transitioning from the temple of stone set in Jerusalem to the temple of his body, which would be destroyed, but raised up. In the Lord's own flesh and blood, then we see the rising up of a new temple, a new center of worship, who is Jesus Christ.
Jesus never contradicted Israel's belief in one God. However, he did give scandal above all when he identified his merciful work. When people heard him saying that he was forgiving sins, it was seen to be blasphemy because only God can forgive sins. They came, bringing to him a paralytic carried to him by four men. Unable to get near Jesus because of the crowd, they opened up the roof above him. They let down the mat on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Child, your sins are forgiven. Here Jesus is proclaiming a beautiful divine identity. He is showing himself to participate in the ways of God as God. He did this in many other ways. Before Abraham was, I am. Or when he said, the Father and I are one. Rather than contradicting Israel's belief in the oneness of God, here the Lord is showing the unfolding of the mystery of the divine trinity, who is one God, yet three divine persons. Certainly, as you read through sacred scripture, we see that there are many people in the Lord's time, both Jewish leaders and faithful Jewish people, who did not deny the Lord's work and who are very favorable to his teachings and to his ways. We think of maybe the Pharisee Nicodemus, who was taught by the Lord himself about the necessity of being born again of water and the Spirit. We think of Joseph of Arimathea, a very prominent Jewish person, who gave his own tomb so that the Lord might have a place to be buried. The Jewish people are not collectively responsible for the death of Jesus. The personal sin of anyone who actually participated in the Lord's death is only known to God. Only God can see the hearts of individuals and know where they're at when they make the choices they make. Nor can responsibility be given to all the Jews in Jerusalem at the time. Jesus even forgave them from the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The Second Vatican Council states this, Neither all Jews at that time, nor Jews today, can be charged with the crimes committed during his passion. The bottom line is this, all sinners are responsible for the death of Jesus Christ. The church has never forgotten that sinners were the authors and ministers of all the sufferings that the divine Redeemer endured. As we read in the Roman Catechism, which was published after the Council of Trent, we must regard as guilty all those who continue to relapse into their sins since our sins made the Lord Christ suffer the torment of the cross, those who plunge themselves into disorders and crimes crucify the Son of God anew in their hearts. For you place the salvation of the human race on the wood of the cross, so that where death arose, life might again spring forth, and the evil one who conquered on a tree might likewise on a tree be conquered through Christ our Lord. Jesus Christ was handed over according to the definite plan of God. We see as we read sacred scripture that it was not the result of some set of random circumstances or chance. And we see that all who played a part, including the Lord himself, were not passive actors in this event. In fact, God permitted these acts to take place, as St. Peter proclaimed. These acts that flowed forth from the blindness of Herod, of Pontius Pilate, from both Gentile and Jewish leaders that led to the crucifixion and arrest of Jesus. 
As we profess every Sunday in the Creed, Jesus Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. Even the Old Testament foretold of the righteous one who would lay down his life as a ransom for many. Jesus Christ identified himself with the suffering servant as he said, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. He also goes on to say, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer. Even St. Paul speaks of a faith that he received, a tradition that he received. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. For our sake, God made Christ to be sin. St. Peter tells us, You are ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your fathers with the precious blood of Christ. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest at the end of time for your sake. All of man's sins following original sin, of course, are punishable by death. But God sent his Son and made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God, as St. Paul tells us in the second letter to the Corinthians. What does this mean, that God made Jesus Christ to be sin who knew no sin? Pope Benedict, in one of his general audiences on the Church Fathers, speaking of what St. Gregory of Nazianzus said about this very thing, beautifully teaches about what this means for Christ to become sin who knew no sin. These are the words of Pope Benedict. Gregory gave great prominence to Christ's full humanity, to redeem man in the totality of his body, soul, and spirit. Christ assumed all the elements of human nature. Otherwise, man would not have been saved. Disputing the heresy of Apollinarius, who held that Jesus Christ had not assumed a rational mind, Gregory tackled the problem in the light of the mystery of salvation. What has not been assumed has not been healed. And if Christ had not been endowed with a rational mind, how could he have been a man? It was precisely in our mind and our reason that needed and needs the relationship, the encounter with God and Christ. Having become a man, Christ gave us the possibility of becoming, in turn, like him. Nazianzus exhorted people, let us seek to be like Christ, because Christ also became like us, to become God's through him, since he himself through us became a man. He took the worst upon himself to make us a gift of the best. So as St. Gregory said, what has not been assumed has not been healed. But this does not mean that Jesus took the condemnation as if he were a sinner. Rather, it means that he identified himself with our sinful waywardness to show his solidarity with us sinners. So it is that God takes the initiative of universal redeeming love. It should not surprise us because from the moment of sin, God promised that he would do so. As St. John tells us in his first letter, in this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the expiation for our sins. St. Paul tells us also beautifully that God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
Jesus Christ affirms that he came to give his life as a ransom for many. This is not a restrictive term. That does not mean that his death does not apply to all. Rather, it contrasts his person, the person of the Redeemer, with the whole of humanity. As the church declared in the Council of Kyrsae in the year 835, there is not, never has been, and never will be a single human being for whom Christ did not suffer. Christ's whole life is an offering to the Father, as the Lord himself said. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. From the first moment of the incarnation until that moment when the Lord freely drank the cup which was given him by the Father, we see the Lord embracing the Father's plan of divine salvation. It is this selfless love which inspired Jesus' whole life. Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John the Baptist, on seeing his Lord approach him, proclaimed this to the people who were there. John, of course, was hearkening back to two beautiful occurrences in Scripture. One were those suffering servant songs we spoke of earlier. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth, like a lamb led to the slaughter, or a sheep before the shearers. He was silent and opened not his mouth. John the Baptist, of course, was also referring to the Paschal Lamb, that lamb for the Passover, as the Israelites left slavery in Egypt to go to the Promised Land. So John the Baptist was showing that this new lamb, this Lamb of God, would lead his people from slavery to sin to the promise of salvation and redemption. We read this beautifully once again in the book of Isaiah. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our sorrows, and we have thought him as it were a leper and as one struck by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our iniquities. He was bruised for our sins. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his bruises we are healed. We see then in the Lord's words and actions that he freely embraced the Father's redeeming love. He freely embraced God's loving plan. By embracing in his human heart the Father's love for men, Jesus loved them to the end, as the Lord himself said, because greater love has no man than to lay down one's life for one's friends. In suffering and death, the Lord's humanity became the free and perfect instrument of his divine love, which desires the salvation of all. As the Lord said, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Finally, in the Last Supper, the Lord anticipated the free offering of his life. We see the Lord in the upper room transforming that Passover meal into the meal of his divine love, which foreshadowed the suffering he would endure the next day. This was a voluntary offering to the Father for the salvation of men. As the Lord said in the words of consecration, this is my body which is given for you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Not only did the Lord freely give and freely pour, he also in that moment established two sacraments so that this free gift might continue to our day. The sacrament of the Holy Eucharist, which brings us the sacrifice of the Lord until the Lord comes again, and the sacrament of the priesthood, when the Lord commanded to offer perpetually this sacrifice in memory of him.
in the Garden of Gethsemane, we see the Lord verbalize the horror which the suffering he was about to endure meant for his sacred humanity. Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. Despite this, however, since his human nature had been assumed by the divine person of the author of life, the Lord's human will remained faithful to the will of the Father for the sake of our salvation. But not my will, but yours be done. Jesus carried our sin in his body, becoming obedient unto death, again accepting the cup offered to him by his Father. Christ's death is the unique and definitive sacrifice. It's both the paschal sacrifice, the lamb who takes away the sins of the world, and the sacrifice of the new covenant, which reestablishes man to communion with the Father. The sacrifice of Christ is unique, perfect, and definitive. It completes and surpasses all other sacrifices. It is a gift from God the Father, and at the same time is the offering of the Son of God through the Holy Spirit. In this sacrifice, Jesus substitutes his obedience for our disobedience, as St. Paul reminds us in his letter to the Romans. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. As the sin of Adam brought us to the life of sin, so the one act of Jesus Christ will bring us all to the life of grace. Jesus consummates his love for us on the cross. Christ knew and loved all when he offered his life. Again, it is this love to the end that confers on Christ's sacrifice its value as redemption and reparation, as atonement and satisfaction. It's not just that Jesus died. It's that he loved us all the way to actually laying down his life for us that made this act the cause of our hope. We then are called to participate in the cross of Christ. We are invited to participate in Christ's sacrifice once again, as St. Paul tells us in his second letter to the Corinthians, the love of God compels us because we are convinced that one has died for all. Therefore, all have died. In the incarnate person, Christ has in some way united himself to every person so that the possibility of being made partners in a way known to God in the Paschal Mystery is offered to all men. Jesus Christ himself told us this, take up your cross and follow me. As St. Rose of Lima reminds us, the cross is the only ladder to heaven. We then are privileged with the possibility, like our Lord, of loving to the end, to lay down our lives for Christ so that he might raise us up to glory. Jesus Christ underwent a real death and a real burial. As St. Gregory of Nyssa beautifully explains, God the Son did not impede death from separating his soul from his body according to the necessary order of nature, but has reunited them to one another in the resurrection so that he might himself be in his person the meeting point for death and life. By arresting in himself the decomposition of nature produced by death, and so becoming the source of reunion for the separated parts. But of course, the psalmist had promised, had prophesied that the Holy One would not be abandoned to corruption. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor let your Holy One see corruption. We experience this in a beautiful way in our own baptisms as we participate in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. 
as St. Paul tells us in his letter to the Romans, we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Scripture calls the abode of the dead to which Christ descended to hell. Sheol in Hebrew or Hades in Greek. It was not the hell of the damned. It was a place where all the just were awaiting the preaching of the gospel. And here in this moment, as Jesus descended to the place of the dead to proclaim to all those from Adam to that moment who had died, the good news of salvation, we see the beautiful completeness of the preaching of the gospel to all people. As St. Peter tells us, the gospel is preached even to the dead. The descent into hell brings the gospel message of salvation to complete fulfillment. This spread of Christ's redemptive work to men of all times and all places. By dying, Christ destroyed him who has the power of death, that is the devil. By descending to the place of the dead, he delivered all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong bondage. As we read in the prophet Hosea, which was quoted by St. Paul, I will deliver them out of the hand of death. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy death. O hell, I will be thy bite. And as we read beautifully prophesied in the book of Isaiah, on this mountain he will destroy the veil that veils all peoples, the web that is woven over all nations. He will destroy death forever. An ancient homily from Holy Saturday beautifully captures the wonder and the incredible nature of this event of Christ descending to those who had died to proclaim the great news of salvation. This homily is quoted in part in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and it is the reading for Holy Saturday as the world awaits the celebration of the resurrection. Today, a great silence reigns on earth, a great silence and a great stillness, a great silence because the king is asleep. The earth trembled and is still because God has fallen asleep in the flesh, and he has raised up all who have slept ever since the world began. He has gone to search for Adam, our first father, as for a lost sheep, greatly desiring to visit those who live in darkness and in the shadow of death. He has gone to free from sorrow Adam and his bonds and Eve captive with him. He who is both their God and the son of Eve. I am your God, who for your sake have become your son. I order you, O sleeper, to awake. I did not create you to be a prisoner in hell. Rise from the dead, for I am the life of the dead. As is sung in the Byzantine liturgy at Easter, Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. Alleluia. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the crowning truth of our faith in Christ. It is an actual historical event. This has been manifested by many accounts, including this one from St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians. He says, I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. 
the first element encountered on that Easter day was the empty tomb. And it is the, really the first step towards recognizing the reality of what had taken place. The empty tomb, of course, is not in and of itself a proof of the resurrection, but it is an essential sign of a great reality. The sign was made manifest to many, the holy women, Peter, John. But this empty tomb was different from the tomb of Lazarus. Recall that Lazarus walked out of the tomb still bandaged in his burial bands. Jesus Christ left the tomb and left his burial cloths behind. This was a new reality, and John recognized that when he walked into that tomb. Then, of course, we have the appearances of the risen Christ to many others. After the empty tomb was discovered, the Lord appeared first to Mary Magdalene and to the holy women. They became the first proclaimers of the resurrection of Christ to the apostles. Then, of course, Christ appears to Peter and the other apostles. Paul speaks of an event when the Lord, the risen Lord, appeared to over 500 people. But the hypothesis that the resurrection was produced by the apostles' faith will not hold up, since it is reported that on several occasions there were experiences of doubt by the apostles, even up to Jesus' last recorded appearance to them before he ascended into heaven. The Lord himself chastised the apostles for not believing in the fact that he had risen from the dead. It is precisely then these encounters with the risen Christ which form the foundation of our faith in the resurrection. By means of allowing them to touch him, to share a meal with them, to be in their presence, the risen Lord invites his disciples to recognize that he's not merely a ghost, but that it is his same body, the same body that he had as he walked with them, performed miracles, taught them, the same body that was offered on the cross. In fact, the Lord's glorified body is still marked by the wounds of the Passion. St. Thomas Aquinas tells us that the Lord's glorified body will be forever marked by those wounds, so that when we get to heaven, they will be for us trophies of Christ's victory and a reminder to us of why it is that we can share eternity with him in the kingdom of heaven. Yet this body, this real body, possesses the new properties of a glorified body, a body not limited by space or time, Therefore, the Lord is free to appear to his disciples how and where he wished and under various circumstances. The Lord's resurrection was not a return to earthly life, as was Lazarus's resurrection. While Lazarus went on to live, to continue to live an earthly existence, the Lord now, in his glorified manner, was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and shares the divine life in his glorious state. While the resurrection was an historical event, it is also, of course, a transcendent event. No one witnessed the resurrection, and no evangelist describes it. As we hear beautifully proclaimed in the Easter exultant, O truly blessed night, worthy alone, to know the time and hour when Christ rose from the underworld. Although, again, the resurrection was an historical event verified by the empty tomb, verified by the Lord's appearances to the apostles and others, it transcends and surpasses history as a mystery of faith. For this reason, the risen Christ did not reveal himself to the whole world, but only to his disciples, making them and calling them to be witnesses to others of the resurrection.
the resurrection, of course, is a transcendent work of God. We see each of the three persons of the Trinity at work as one, each manifesting their own characteristics. The Father's power raised up Christ, his Son, introducing Christ's humanity and body into the Trinity. The Son takes again the life which he freely offered. The Spirit brings to life and glorifies that reunited body and soul. In fact, St. Paul insists that this manifestation of God's power is the work through the Holy Spirit. Jesus is conclusively revealed, as St. Paul tells us, as Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. As we hear in common preface four of the Mass, it is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Father most holy, through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your word through whom you made all things, whom you sent as our Savior and Redeemer, incarnate by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin. Fulfilling your will and gaining for you a holy people, he stretched out his hands as he endured his passion, so as to break the bonds of death and manifest the resurrection. The resurrection constitutes the confirmation of all of Christ's teachings and works. Christ's resurrection is the fulfillment of the promises of the Old Testament and Jesus himself during his earthly life, that all of this was to take place in accordance with the scriptures. In the resurrection, the truth of Jesus' divinity is confirmed. This paschal mystery has two aspects then. By Christ's death, he liberates us from sin. By his resurrection, he opens up for us the way to new life. It brings about the grace of filial adoption, gaining for us a real share in the life of the only begotten Son, our opportunity to become adopted sons and daughters of God. Christ's resurrection and the risen Christ himself is the principle and source of our future resurrection as St. Paul said in his first letter to the Corinthians. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. St. Athanasius tells us the two reasons for the incarnation were first, so that Jesus Christ could undo the law involving the ruin of men because of sin, and second, so that Jesus Christ could raise us up to turn away our path from eternal corruption. Again, in the second preface for the solemnity of the ascension of the Lord, for after his resurrection, he plainly appeared to all his disciples and was taken up to heaven in their sight, that he might make us sharers in his divinity. For 40 days after his resurrection, Jesus Christ, the risen Christ, showed himself to the apostles under the appearance of ordinary humanity. But the Lord's final apparition ends with the irreversible entry of his humanity into divine glory, symbolized by the cloud and by heaven, where he is seated from that time forward at the Father's right hand. From the moment of the ascension of the Lord into heaven, forever with the Trinity is our humanity in the person of Jesus Christ, in the person of the risen Christ. It is the precursors we have just heard 
of our entry into heaven and of our ultimate union with our glorified body and soul in the kingdom of heaven. There now in heaven, the risen Christ permanently exercises his priesthood, for he always lives to make intercession for those who draw near to God through him, as the writer of the letter to the Hebrews told us. By the Father's right hand, we understand the glory and honor of divinity, where he who exists as Son of God before all ages, indeed as God, of one being with the Father, is seated bodily after he became incarnate and his flesh was glorified. Being seated at the Father's right hand then signifies the inauguration of the Messiah's kingdom. He is crowned forever with glory in heaven. Jesus Christ, the head of the church, precedes us into the Father's glorious kingdom so that we, members of his body, may live in hope of one day being with him forever. Christ is the mediator who assures us of the permanent outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Again, this beautiful account of the ascension of the Lord given to us by the Acts of the Apostles. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said this, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who is taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. <laughs> 